Blog Talk Radio. You're tuned in to N5D Radio, the next dimension in radio, where we bring you the hottest, in-depth, spiritual, metaphysical, esoteric conversations and news. Get ready for spirit, body, and mind to expand in three, two, one, 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 one. Greetings, and welcome to Quantum Healing with Candace. I'm your host, Candace Craw Goldman. The program was created to assist humans in this rapidly changing world, and its foundation is based upon the late, great Dolores Cannon's work. So thank you, Dolores, for continuing to be here with us. And also thanks to Greg Prescott and Michelle Walling, at n5d.com for making this show possible. With humanity's new understanding and acceptance of the quantum world and the role that consciousness plays in shaping both our individual and our collective reality, we have plenty of subject material. I am a full-time practitioner of Dolores' hypnosis method and I've had the honor and privilege of working with and alongside of her for several years. You can find out more about my practice at newearthjourney.com. And before we get started tonight, for those of you who are looking for a practitioner of Dolores' method, you may find these wonderful people at DoloresCannonQHHT.com. That's DoloresCannonQHHT.com. Also, If you would like to participate live on the show tonight, please call this number in the U.S., 646-716-8890. That's 646-716-8890. Tonight is November 20th, 2015, and the topic of the show is forgiveness. You know, it seems like there is a lot to forgive in the world today. There's a lot of violence being perpetrated on others, both in groups and on individuals. We have enemies, and perhaps they volunteered to teach us how to forgive. If we learn how to forgive and let go, perhaps anger would not have a chance to manifest into cancer in our bodies. And we learn... Forgiveness and understanding sometimes comes when we don't take things so personally, but but look about look from a higher perspective, a greater perspective about the things that happen in our lives. And possibly one of the largest lessons humans need to learn and found that they've needed to learn is to love and have compassion and to forgive themselves. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about forgiveness. And until we have some callers come in, I guess it's going to be my turn to talk about a story of forgiveness. So here's a session. Here's a session I did actually quite a number of years ago, about four years ago, and I thought I would share it with you. It's a QHHT session. This is the quantum healing hypnosis method that Dolores taught to practitioners around the world how to heal many many things, both the the mind, the spirit, and the body. And in this particular session that I'd like to share with you this evening, I had um, a woman come see me, and I'll call her Mary. And she, she was in a troubled marriage. She felt unsupported. And both the husband and the wife had betrayed each other in a variety of ways. They had decided to open their hearts and, um, and lay these betrayals on the table and, and forgive each other and to try to have their marriage work, but it just didn't seem to be working. And that was one of the reasons that Mary came to see me for a session. 
And in Mary's mind, although um, they had both been a party to betrayal, she really felt that her husband was was the prime um, perpetrator, shall we say, in 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 the marriage. And she kind of felt that, you know, he had done more betraying than she had. And she understood that they both had to forgive each other. Intellectually, Mary understood that her husband had to forgive himself. But after speaking with her, we found out that she kind of equated her husband's self-forgiveness as something that just sort of minimized the actions that were done, quote unquote, to her. And Mary's higher self said, you know, Mary has a very, very strong mind. She believes that she's forgiven her husband and she has done so only with her mind and not her heart. Her heart has an infinite capacity for love and forgiveness, infinite. She has only just recently begun to open her heart. She has a long way to go. Forgiveness cannot come from the mind but only from the heart. She chose this path once again to have a very strong mind. And when she's fully able to realize that she need not allow the mind to control her reality and that the truer power of self comes from the heart, that the infinite love that is available from her heart can come forth and she'll be able to forgive and feel love so strong it will be glorious. Her higher self went on to say, once her heart opened, all of her physical issues would subside. But the higher self also said they would not, at that time, heal all of her symptoms as she had not yet done the work herself to realize and embrace. They said they had given her subtle clues even earlier that week. They gave her a cough. And then, again, after she had another loud and emotional outburst with her husband over the betrayals, Just a couple of days before the session, they allowed the cough to turn into a flu, to fully descend upon her, to really get her attention. They said this was an opportunity for her to release, for forgiveness again, and for time to spend with herself healing. I asked for the higher self to assist her heart in expanding and healing right then. And the higher self complied, but only in a partial way, as it stood firm that they would not do this work for Mary. This was the most fascinating session and the most difficult part for me was trying to get the higher self to give suggestions on how exactly Mary was to continue this expansion and focus on her heart. Suggesting visualization, meditation, specific prayer, and all were met with the statement that these were mostly mind-centered activities. The higher self kept repeating the focus should be on the heart. The higher self also made it clear that fear was also centered in the mind and was not to be focused upon. Not only the emotional fear Mary carried about possible future betrayal from her spouse, but also about worldly fear. The higher self said that to focus on personal fear or fearful conspiracy theories in earthly matters was largely a mental construct and could be easily diminished by concentrating on love and living from the heart. And the higher self said they had no doubt that by the end of Mary's life, she will have understood the wisdom and power of the heart and that the recent earth changes and revelations in her marriage had begun the change. It was up to her whether she wanted to walk the path sooner rather than later. So that is my contribution to this evening's story about forgiveness. And, of course, we will be using that term all throughout the night, and I'm sure in association with the heart. And what I'd like to do now is um, take a caller. And I believe we have my friend and colleague, Mary Truitt, on the line. Mary, are you there? Yeah, I'm right here, Candace. Hi, how are you? Hi, hi, Mary. I'm I'm doing just fine. Thank you so much for calling in. Oh, absolutely. I just don't want anybody to confuse me with the Mary you were just talking about. <laughs> Your uh, story. Mary. 
That I yes, forgive forgive me. You know, I was thinking that, uh, and, and you know, you were calling in, and I know our friend Marilyn was calling in, and I thought, gee, I should change that name. But in my notes, she was Mary, and it was going to take too much time for me to to make her Sally. So for, so forgive me. This, nope, nope. <laughs> not at all. Not we've we've not traded sessions yet, but maybe someday. Not yet. I'd love to. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. Yeah, I love this topic would, because. Um, you know, it seems that everything about moving past trauma has to is about forgiveness, whether it's forgiveness of self or forgiveness of others. It's just the work we have to do to move on from, you know, sticky situations, whether they're traumatic or challenging or whatever. It's all about forgiveness. It really is. It really is. And I don't know about you, but I have found that it tends to be much harder to forgive yourself than, than even it is to forgive others. You know, it's just fun. It's funny, as we were talking about this, I had this memory of myself when I was about 14. I had a very complicated father who really did cause me a tremendous amount of trauma in my life. And I never, never, never could could forgive him or move past it at all. And I was visiting him. He lived in Mexico. Um, he moved down there after, you know, kind of a some series of sort of unfortunate events up here. And I went down to visit him, even though, you know, it was very complicated and hard. And um, I never really felt I could love him or be close to him because of some of the pain he'd caused me. And one day he was criticizing somebody's daughter for being kind of cruel to the father. And I said, well, she had every right not to be kind to him. He was so cruel to her as a child. And my father said, well, maybe that's true. And then I looked at him and I said, do you have any idea how cruel you were to me when I was a child? And he said, no. And he said, like, like what? And I said a few things to him and he looked at me just completely astonished and said, I had no idea. I have no memory of any of that. And it was the strangest thing. At that moment, I felt this almost like a streak of lightning go through the top of my head all the way down through my body. And the anger and the resentment and everything was just gone. It wasn't even a matter of wanting to forgive or thinking I should forgive or, you know, at that age, I don't even think I realized I was holding on to anger or whatever. I just knew I was Mm -hmm. hurt, but it was gone, and I could never access it again after that. After that, all I felt for him was kindness and sympathy. That's an amazing story. Mary, I wonder, was it because of his, you must have, looked at and felt his reaction as being a completely honest one, like like he didn't know, he didn't have any idea. You know, I think I think that is what it, I think that, I, I sort of just always thought it was a kind of a miracle. I'm not really sure why it happened, you know, but ever since then forgiveness has been easier for me than I think it was before that. It's now that I'm saying that I think I'm kind of lying. I actually forgiveness is not as easy, especially for <laughs> myself. But you know, it was a miracle, and um, I know now that it's possible to forgive somebody in an instant. And so that's why in these sessions, when I say to people, "Let's forgive" or "Let's move past this," I know that it's possible, and it gives me hope yeah, for the. Most terrible things that, you know, people do need to forgive, that it is possible to move on. There's a kind of a grace that can that can come to us. Isn't, do you find, Mary, I know that I've thought about this issue quite a bit. Of course, in our work, we have to. It's, you know, it's at the heart, of course, of, of the matter. And, and the pun is very much intended there. Um, isn't it that humans are afraid to forgive sometimes because they feel if they forgive, they are agreeing to or accepting whatever action or event took place as if they condone it, as if they uh, wish 
uh, or allow it to happen again. It's, isn't that part of the confusion? That's some of the thoughts I've had. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. It's, it, it, some people equate saying, um, you know, that's okay, I forgive you, with saying it's okay that you did that. Um, but that's really, you know, sort of tit-for-tat thinking. You know, that's really as if everything is an even exchange, that what you did, I have an equal reaction for that, you know. And that's not always the way pain works. One, you can hurt somebody and not even know it. You can deliberately try to hurt somebody and they aren't hurt at all. So it's not necessarily an even exchange when, when there is pain involved. And so, you know, my sense is that forgiving somebody has to be really just almost like a like a ray of light or something. You have to just do it as a um, – you have to not know what the outcome is. Because I think other people's pain is impenetrable. I don't think we know the effect of our words. We don't know. They don't know the effect of their words. So, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I I think that um, that way of thinking is is not as is not as intelligent as it could be. Because Mm -hmm. forgiveness is something we do for ourselves, not for them, in many ways. Um, Exactly. like the old Buddha, I mean, people say Buddha said this. I have no idea if he really said it, but that whole idea that <laughs> hanging on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. Yes. Um, it, it, afraid, and it goes right along with holding on to worry, you know, praying for things that, that you don't want to happen. But it, it seems to be such a human thing that we do this. Do you think that it's, that it's learned do you think that's a part of a belief system? I think it might be a little bit. I think people are in love with their anger. You know, I think people, mm-hmm. I'm angry about this and I'm angry about that. And I'm, you know, I, I think a lot of what I've witnessed in the last couple of weeks with people talking about the terrible events of Paris, um, you know, people are in love with their own opinions about what happened. I'm angry at the Muslims, or I'm angry at gun control, or I'm angry at, you know, or the things that have been happening on campus. Every campuses with, um, you know, I don't know if you've been reading about what happened at Yale and Missouri and hate language and all that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. You know, um, I think people are in love with their own opinions, and the angrier they are, the more they kind of get off on it. And... I'm not sure that anger ever really fuels anything positive. Um, and that's, that's a really anger. interesting point. I wonder if the anger is just feeling some sort of need for passion in a person's yeah. life, you know? I mean, yeah. Well, I noticed that whenever there's a terrible event that's going on, whether I noticed this first when um, I think it was during the Gulf War, that people were, you know, grabbing a glass of wine and sitting down and watching the Gulf War on TV um, and sort of dining out on it. And, you know, I'm really upset about the Gulf War. I'm going to watch it on TV. And and people were almost competitive about, because I think that was one of the first wars where we really did have access to it all the time. Um, And people began to be competitive about who was more upset about the war and who's more upset. About the tragedies and who's and so, you know, that's by way of saying I can't forgive this. This is how deeply I feel this that I can't can't forgive what's happening. And I think it's a way to feel. I I don't know. Maybe maybe people don't want to feel love. Maybe they think that's silly or hallmarky or something. But people would much rather. Mm-hmm. I think many people would rather feel anger. And um, you know, not forgiving others than to feel just love. Maybe it's why. more accessible. Yeah, it's kind of a rush, I guess. You know, when you give in to that anger, be <laughs> a little bit of a rush. You know, you uh, you make me think a little bit about. Uh, uh, of a profound revelation I had in my life about forgiveness. And that is um, in 1989, my brother was killed very suddenly on a beautiful April morning um, by a uh, 
by a young man who lost control of his vehicle and crossed three lanes of traffic and, and ran him over. Wow. And it was, so of course, uh, yeah, it was, it was horrifying and it was, it was such a surprise and it was so awful. And, um, and the events played out, as you might imagine, in a very dramatic way, in, you know, in the next several days after that. But it was pivotal in my life as there was this very strange kind of uh, layers to, to my, my experience of everything that was going on. I, I was experiencing this as a sibling. I was experiencing it as the, the daughter of my parents who were having to deal with this. I was um, involved in all manner of the, the final details and the cleaning out of his apartment and dealing. Actually, I remember my father coming to me and asking me if it would be okay if if this young man would come to my brother Randy's um, funeral service. And wow. I remember being so, uh, yeah, I remember being so completely stunned at the request. And uh, subsequently we found out that this young man had pockets full of speeding tickets and, um, uh, it was a terror, a menace, you know, had one of those hot rod cars and was racing, street racing all the time. And he lost control of his vehicle when, when he killed my brother. And, um, and it, was, it was a strange sort of thing that happened in, in my family. There was a lot that changed even that day. And with that um, question, the dynamics of the family changed in, in a really big way. And I remember thinking that there should be a part of me that should uh, should accept that or should agree to that 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 he sh- possibly should come to the to the funeral service there was there was this part of me that that kind of understood that that was a gesture that might be important to him might be important to his family might be important to all of us at some point but I also knew that the that the shock was too new, it was too raw, and I was, uh, I, you know, I was able to think about all of the people who, you know, loved and admired my brother so much, and and to have the person who, you know, ended his life right there in the midst of it, I, I it just didn't seem right, and I also didn't, I didn't want to know what he looked like, uh-huh. um, and and so uh, I remember saying, you know, basically, no, thank you. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't think this is the place for the celebration of my brother's life. Not, this is not the place for you to attend. And I didn't mean that as a slight or a hurt, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it just, I just didn't, it just didn't seem like that was going to be healthy for me, for my family, for others. But it was very soon after that that I was, um, struck with the the absolute knowing that I could not uh, contain anger towards this young man for ending Randy's life, and and I and I had after death communication with with Randy, and I understood all that. So I so I didn't hold any anger towards him because um, I knew it was going to be detrimental to me. And what's really interesting, Mary, as I watched my parents. Uh, neither one of them at first my my dad was quite quite angry with um with this with this man uh, you know he was just a boy at the time he was just 19 of course he's a man now and in the end you know who my dad ended up being angry at and, and staying angry for a really long time was for the detective who was on the scene not not really? the man at all because the yeah the detective on the scene did a lot of shoulder shrugging and um, and 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 sort of said that because my brother was riding a motorcycle, actually a motorcycle that he was just moving from one place to another while his fiance was following him, no less. So she got to witness the whole thing, and um, he kind of minimized it and and told the young man at the at the scene that it probably was going to be okay because you know those motorcycle riders could be really reckless and of course the detective not knowing that basically this young man had nine reckless driving tickets in his own back pocket it was it was really interesting it took my dad much much longer to forgive the detective than it than 
than he did to forgive the the actual person who ended my brother's life. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think. And and do you feel as if you've now forgiven this young man? Oh yeah, and I did very early on, very very early on. As a matter of fact, um, it took me years to be able to to say this um, out loud. At, I'm not sure I even said it out loud very often, and here I'll say it on the air. But at some point in the middle of all of this, I, I made a, uh, I create, and you know this because we talk art all the time, but I, I, I was in art school, and I actually created a, a sculpture, a carved wooden box. I used sticks and twigs from our childhood home, uh, the garden, and, and, and to, to lay his ashes and, and put flowers in there. And at some point, I remember thinking how utterly beautiful and filled with love and how huge my heart was in the midst of all of this. Like I had this -hmm. this giant, beautiful love feeling. And and it was very strange for my mental capacity, my my intellect, to, to view this. I'm like, are you kidding me? You're finding beauty in the fact that you're never going to see your only sibling ever again? I mean, it was a very strange thing going on in my mind, but it, it truly was the thing that, like, broke my heart. It broke my heart open, and mm-hmm. I understand the value of that uh, and where it's taken me since then. So it was, it was, it was quite a, <laughs> uh, you know, trial by fire kind of thing. Um, did, I, did, I wasn't angry with him. I, I wonder about him a lot, actually, this, this young man. Um, I wonder how how his life has turned out. I don't know. And are you curious? Oh, very curious. Actually, not more than six, eight months ago, I think I tried Googling his name again, but it's a very common name, and I found nothing, and I didn't pursue it very, very far. Mm-hmm. Might be a question to ask an SC someday if you're really curious. What Have you, have you some- explored? Have you explored that? Why your brother was killed at that time? Why he? Why uh, that happened? Yeah. Well, yeah, and part of it was, you know, he was done. He was also very awake. I mean, he was. He had already saw the repeating numbers and figured out the game stuff, and was talking to me about that kind of stuff back in 1988 and 1989. I had no idea what he was talking about. None, because I was sound wow. asleep. So he was wow. he was uh, very he was very wide awake. Here's an interesting thing for you. Uh, so on my way out to the mailbox, couple I think it was a couple of years ago. On my way out to the mailbox, and I'm just thinking about my brother, thinking about my brother so much on the way out to the mailbox, where we get our local newspaper delivered because we're out in the country, so um, we get it via mail. And I open up. The, the you know it's like a 12 page newspaper and i'm on my way walking back to the house and i'm looking at the headline and uh i read and that detective actually um had uh he was up for uh, sheriff of the county that i was living in and i looked at you know i about fell down uh, you know on the way cuz i remembered his name very very well and uh and it just it was it was very interesting the turmoil that 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 took me into because uh because my dad was still carrying around some pain of that you know his his description of the the accident scene and kind of how uncaring this detective was he he was doing a lot more back padding to the driver of the car than my father whose son was laying in the gutter um God, you know awful. with a sheet over his head yeah. yeah. Well, enough of that, Mary. <laughs> how about how well, about you tell I us can a tell forgiveness you story? <laughs> yes, uh, I please had, do. I had, a, I had such a wonderful um, experience with forgiveness the other day with a client. So I don't know if you would you like me to tell you the story. Absolutely. Okay. So a woman came to me. Um, she was from Europe, and she um, was I think around fifty years old, and she had had a perfectly fine life, you know, just a few ups and downs like anybody. And um, about five years ago, she moved into an apartment, a house that was her dream house. She fixed it all up exactly the way she liked it. 
and um, she and her son moved into the house, and on the day she moved in, she was the happiest. She said, I was the happiest I'd ever been, and I finally had everything I really dreamed of. And on that day, she began to experience huge pains all over her body. She couldn't. She began to get choked up and not be able to breathe in her throat. She began to experience back pain, head pain, neck pain, um, aches and pains just everywhere. And, you know, one of those things where she went to every different kind of doctor there was, intestinal, um, you know, gastro doctor, um, neurologist, um, blah, 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 everybody, um, uh, to the point where she decided finally that the house must be making her sick. And so she rented the house out to somebody else, moved into a condominium. Then that condominium began to make her sick. And mm-hmm. she she just couldn't find, she could not find a place to call home that felt comfortable. And the odd thing was when she would leave and go back to Europe during the summers, she felt better. And yet she couldn't leave, um, she couldn't, leave America and so she wasn't able to go move back there. Anyway, she and then by the time she came to see me, she really couldn't even think straight anymore. She's just in so much pain all the time. She actually sent her one child. She's no longer married, but she sent her one child to Europe to live with her family because she said I simply can't take care of him. I'm sick all the time and I spend all my time going to doctors and going to work and that's it. And and she'd really tried everything and you know People told her she had fibromyalgia. They told her she must have chronic fatigue. They told her maybe it's in your head. Um, So she's tried everything. So she came really desperately, just help me, help me. How how can you help me? And, of course, as you know, when people come to us in so much pain, it really is hard. Um, And we don't know, you know, maybe they are. She kept saying, do I have an entity attached to me? Um, (laughs) You know, we don't don't know Mm -hmm. the answers to so we start to work with them. So um, we got her to her first life where she was um, walking in a desert, and she quickly passed through that life. She didn't really want to explore it. She explained it later when we were talking to her subconscious. But um, she was actually a merchant who had walked, he'd been robbed in the desert and um, was moving along to the next town and completely didn't care. He said, I'll just make my fortune over again. Um, uh, but in the second lifetime, she was a um, healer in some kind of medieval lifetime, I think. She was sitting at a huge desk surrounded by um, all kinds of bottles and glasses and using a feather pen, um, and she was the kind of uh, client who did not enter the bodies of the lives that she was witnessing. So... You and I know what that means. So sometimes when you're doing a past mm-hmm. life regression, the person will say, oh, I'm a man, or oh, I'm a woman, oh, I'm a fish, oh, I'm a tree, oh, I'm a whatever. She would just see the people that she was. So mm-hmm. she kept seeing this guy sitting at the table, and I said, well, can you talk to him then? If you're not him, can you speak with him and ask him questions? So she began to ask him questions. What do you do? And he said, I'm a healer. I make potions. So I asked her to ask him if he could make her a potion to make her feel better. And Mm -hmm. it was sort of funny. You know, she said, he's very irritated with me. He doesn't know what I'm doing here. (laughs) He wants me to go away. (laughs) um, But he grudgingly agreed, and he made her a potion that was a small glass of red liquid And then he got a cream and began to rub it on her back. And she said, he's rubbing me very roughly. I don't know why he has to be so rough. Um, And he wants me to leave. So he gave her the potion and rubbed the cream on her back, and she left. So then we went to the last life, which was this was the important life. Um, And in this life, she saw a young man standing next to an airplane And she said, uh, he's 29 years old. She knew right away how old he was, and she knew his name, which was Otto, O-T-T-O. And she said, he's a um, a pilot. And she said, it looks like some kind of war plane. And she said, I think he must be a Nazi. Um, So I said, well, let's ask him. Ask him, what war are you in? What war are you fighting? 
And he, she said he laughed at me and said, what war? I don't know. I'm not in a war. What war? So, you know, we realized, I don't know if she realized it, but I realized it was before the, the World War II had begun. It was, you know, he was a pilot before the war. Um, and so we went up in his plane with him, very exciting, lots of buttons. Um, she, you know, she loved going with him, and they flew over Europe, and he was delivering um, some things, some cargo to um, somewhere. She didn't know where until we got there, and when we got there, he landed the plane, and he was greeted by a huge group of soldiers, and she said, oh, they're so skinny, they're so skinny, um, which is one of those great, you know, details that, I love getting in in these regressions because it's so, I don't know, it's just very affirming to me. Um, And she said, oh, the men are just so skinny and we're bringing them blankets and food. So there were some kind of meal packages they were bringing and and these soldiers were doing some kind of military exercise. She thought maybe in Belgium or um, uh, I think it was Belgium, she thought. So... Um, then we get back in the plane. We move forward to the next um, important day, which is what we do in quantum healing. We ask the person to move to the next important day when something important is happening or something significant. So we went to that day, and then he was 35 years old, and he was getting a medal pinned on him, and he was, had completely changed. He'd gone from being this cheerful, happy young man who delivered um, blankets and meals to being very, very upset. He was a bomber pilot. And he was getting a medal for having killed a huge number of people and destroyed a lot of targets and things. Um, And he didn't even want to look at who was pinning it on him. He said he knew he was some kind of German general and he didn't want any part of it anymore. He wanted to leave. So then we moved to the next important day and he was Back at home, the war was over, I guess, and he was at his farm living with a wife and two children, but very, very, very distant from his wife and children. He liked to spend all his time in a sort of a barn making a wooden, something wooden, and she thought it was an oar for a boat, but she said that makes no sense, there's no water. And then I asked her if if she thought it could be a propeller. Maybe he was building a, making a propeller. And she said, that's not possible. There are no wooden propellers. And I said, well, yes, there were from in the olden days. They had <laughs> wooden airplane propellers. So she said, oh, maybe that's what he's making. I don't know. But he's very sad. And um, he works on this propeller. And then, sadly, the next scene, um, his daughter was getting married much too young. He was very worried about it and kept drinking because he didn't like it that she was getting married. He thought she was too young to make that decision. Uh, I'll skip over some of that. And then the next scene, very, very sad. He was sitting outside at the farm and his wife had just died. Her leg had been cut off in an accident on the farm. And so he was sitting there with her dying in his arms and... um, Then he saw himself two weeks later um, sitting at the kitchen table drinking and trying to drown his sorrows. And then he decides he's going to leave Germany. He can't stand being there anymore. He can't stand all the... Now it became clear that he was just suffering from all the pain that he'd inflicted on others and that he couldn't forgive himself. He couldn't stand it, that he had just dropped all these bombs from these planes and killed all these people. And now his wife was dead. His daughter had also died at that point. And um, he was just very upset. So he moves to America and starts all over again. And I figured this must be in the late 40s, early 50s. Um, And he can't find a job anywhere. He lives in a horrible room all by himself with sort of a nightstand and a, you know, coffee plate or something. And Mm -hmm. he he finally finds a job at a church where he builds staircases and pews inside the church. And I I, I guess it was a kind of speaking of forgiveness for himself at the church. Um, Wow. And then we we skipped ahead to, I hope this isn't too much detail. No, this is wonderful. That's why people listen to the show is to hear these details. They're amazing. Yeah, so then he... um, We moved ahead to his dying bed. It was his last day of his life. He was lying in his bed, white-haired, and he's crying and talking to the priest. And um, 
So I said, okay, we know what he's upset about and what he wants forgiveness for. He's upset for all the people that he killed. And what I began to, you know, slowly put together over the course of the session was that my client was feeling all of the pain that not only Otto felt, but that he had taken on of the people he had killed. That he had, through his horror and sadness at having killed so many people, attempted somehow to take on the pain that he had caused, to take it from them. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, as some and sort of penance. Some kind of penance, yeah, that he couldn't, you know, move on with his life. And that she, because he was never forgiven for this and never forgave himself, that it carried on into this lifetime, which would have been the consecutive next lifetime. So wow. what I figured out finally was that on the day that she was the happiest she'd ever been in her life, that vibration activated because she wasn't allowed to be that happy. Oh, my gosh. You see what I'm saying? So oh that my vibration gosh. activated on the day when she finally said, hip, hip, hooray, I'm so happy, and something inside her said, no, you're not allowed to be this happy. Remember what you did. Remember all that. And so... It sort of came back to haunt her. And so I thought, if I can get him, since we know time doesn't exist, right? So if we can heal him on his bed, then that will ripple across into this lifetime and heal her now. So So I said to him, so I said to her, now talk to Otto and tell him, that he needs to confess to the priest what he did and that he's sad about it and he can't forgive himself. And we had had him tell the priest how upset he was, tell the priest um, that he couldn't forgive himself, and we asked the priest to forgive him, and the priest said, okay, I forgive him. Then we had Otto um, try to forgive himself, which he didn't want to do. So I said, all right, let's let him leave his body and go to the other side. We'll see who greets him. And... The moment when he crossed over to the other side, I think it's one of the most amazing, beautiful moments I've had in doing this work. A huge crowd of white, faceless, sort of ghost figures walked towards him and embraced him. And they were all the people that he had killed. And the woman was just, you know obviously so moved and she said i can see them look how beautiful they are and and you know they were forgiving her they were embracing otto as he died and crossing over wow. and so he really i said hey now you can see there is no death they survived their own deaths and they forgive you and you don't need this pain anymore you don't need to take this on anymore so wow. i thought that was a pretty Forgiveness story, <laughs> and that it shows is a great really great forgiveness story. How this works across time, you know. I call my my little website "Healing Across Time," and I do it because you know when you heal in one lifetime, you heal in all of them. Right. That's just so amazing. What an excellent, excellent story. Very, very beautiful. As how how did he? react after the session how what was that like for him after the fact oh for her you mean for the client oh yes yeah. yeah sorry i'm not thinking i'm calling him a him <laughs> yeah, I know. she was a him there well she was quite disoriented and um she you know she said she, she'd lived in so much fear and so much pain for so long one of the things that's hard for people when they have or challenging i should say when they have a healing is that They come out of it and say, well, what if it's coming right back? What if, you know, what if this didn't work? What if it's not real? What if it's, you know, whatever. So she began to have doubts right away. And I just said, you know, of course, what I always say, which is you have to um, not go back. Don't go back. You know, just keep moving forward and allow the healing, this healing that you reached for that you now have, you don't need to go back to that set point. 
you know, it's like when people mm-hmm. when people lose a certain amount of weight and then as soon as they've lost it, they gain it back again, you know. I said to her, mm-hmm. you're healed. You've let it go. Just keep listening to the tape. And so I just always say, you know, Dolores told us, listen to the tape, listen to the tape, and then you'll keep receiving the healing. And this was only about a week ago, so I have not heard back yet from her, um, but I will probably be writing her sometime in the next week or two to um, ask her how she's doing. Wonderful. Just just truly excellent. And, you know, there's just so many people who probably can really relate to that, if not in their current life, of course, in their past lives and with the fact that humans have been at battle and war with each other in large groups and in small and countries and villages against each other for, for you know, throughout time. Just imagine how that must, uh, it must affect so many people on our planet and many people who have, you know, really don't even have any idea that they're of dealing course, with all the things. All the aches and pains and all the, you know. Sure. I mean, Dolores, I'll never forget, I think it was in my first training with Dolores where we talked about scars and birthmarks, and not scars, but mm-hmm. birthmarks and um, mm-hmm. odd marks people have on their body. And, you know, um, she said if you see somebody with a mark on their back, a mole or something, sometimes it's because mm-hmm. they had an arrow there or a... Yeah. Um, a bullet and that after the sessions, you know, if they are um, healed from that, if they experience the trauma and let it go and are healed from that trauma, then the scar will disappear. The mark will disappear. Uh-huh. You know, our uh, we, we've got a great colleague, um, Laurie Paulina, and he's got an amazing story about a scar. He's, he's in the middle of writing a book about it. I hope to have him on a show in January. Just some incredible stories about uh, him as a Civil War soldier and some of the things that are going on in his life right now that are so connected with what happened in that life. And it has to do with the scar um, but I won't give away the punchline there because it's just astonishing. I mean, it, my my jaw's on the ground right now. I'm just even thinking about that story. We, oh, that um, sounds we great. Just don't, <laughs> we just don't have we don't have any idea the the depth and the layers of of all of the different things that happen with consciousness through all the different timelines, realities, lives. You know, all of that. So. Well, thank no, you, Mary, so we don't. much for <laughs> you're welcome for taking taking the time out to spend a little time with me again this evening and and telling us some great stories. And why don't you remind people how they can how they can find you? You're in you're in Maryland. Uh, yes, I practice in Annapolis, um, Maryland, which is about 40 minutes outside of Washington D.C. and about 30 minutes away from Baltimore. And um, my website is www.healingacrosstime.com. And um, I'd love to hear from anybody who's looking for a session. Um, it's the work that I love to do. So <laughs> anytime. It really is. And I have a Facebook hey, page, um, which is also called Healing Across Time. Okay. Hey, Mary, before you go, why don't you share with our yeah. listeners that really cool, wonderful tidbit that you just that you shared via text and Facebook, the, the, the one, the one liner about the crop circle. It's just too cool. Oh my God. I love that. (laughs) That session that I, I, I have not recovered from that session yet. That was two days ago. And I had a client who was, first of all, a fish. It was so brilliant the things that she said about being a fish and she talked about humans not we are not supposed to eat meat and fish but that it's okay for us to eat plants they came here for that and she said the most brilliant things about it but um at one point after she was a fish her guardian spirit came through and um, her guardian spirit said in a very very authoritative voice my name is athena and i come from the constellation of boots and I said, and I 
And I said, oh, and I said, I thought she was an Arcturian. And she said, Boots is in the Arcturian constellation. And I said, okay, sorry. Um, (laughs) And she told me all kinds of incredible things. And I got the most amazing affirmation. I know this is a little little bit longer than you asked for me to tell, but I had had... She she said, oh, my God, these chakras are a disaster in this client, you know, this woman, her person that she was here to take care of. And she said, they're all cracked and um, and in ruins, and I need to heal them and spin them. She said, I'm going to, and I said, well, tell me what you're doing. And she said, I'm healing them, and then I'm going to blow on them and spin them around so that all the chakras get moving again. And I said, oh, well, thank you so much for doing that. And then I said, because I always do this. I mean, it's kind of probably a bad habit I have. But I said, as long as you're going to spin her chakras, can you give mine a little spin too? (laughs) And she laughed and she said, of course. She said, of course. So she began to do that. And then she began to laugh. And I said, what's so funny? And she said, oh, you have a purple crown on your head covered with diamonds. And I said, I do? Wow. And she said, yes, it's very funny. It's very pretty. It's a purple crown with diamonds. But what freaked me out was that about a month ago, I had a session with Anna Merkaba, who is a um, healer who I think lives somewhere in Europe. And at the end of the session, she wrote me about a 30-page um, message about what she'd done. She said, I have placed a purple crown on your head with diamonds. <gasps> Wow. And so (laughs) for me, that was such an affirmation in so many dimensions. I thought it's an affirmation of Anna Merkaba's work, an affirmation of Athena from Boots. (laughs) I mean, it's just incredible. And an affirmation of QHHT. I mean, it was so incredible. Um, But the question that you asked me was um, the little little thing that I put on my Facebook page, which was I asked her about crop circles. And she said, crop circles are like galactic apps. She said, you know how you have apps on your phone? And I said, yes. And she said, crop circles are galactic galactic apps. Download them and play with them. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, I loved it. Just it. Galactic loved it. apps. Oh, I Yeah. I loved it so much, and the way that, uh, I mean, I got it in such a wonderful, of course, electronic way. You know, I got it on a little text, which was just like another little, like, beep, a little thing that came yep. across the yep. internet. <laughs> and I was so tickled by it. It was it was wonderful. Well, uh, Mary, I look forward to chatting with you again on the show. You always have such wonderful stories. Thank you again. Oh, thank you, Candace. I love your show. I love you, Mary. You have fun this evening with love your family. You. Thanks, okay, Candace. thanks for calling. I'll in. keep, I'll keep okay, listening. Bye. Okay, bye bye. <laughs> thanks, bye. So wonderful, Mary Truitt, and um, I'm going to waste no time at all to begin to speak to my next guest because I've actually known this person online for a number of years, and I have never spoken with him on the telephone or in any other way. In real life, isn't that true, Mr. Dewitt? Hi, Candace. So good to hear your voice. <laughs> Hi. Okay, I'm I'm gonna try it now. So I'm gonna t- I'm going to try to uh, to say your name in the best way that I can. So, Mr. Right. Dewitt's name is Yaron. Oh my God, that is so good. Yeah, that is <laughs> like way better than expected. Like my name gets butchered here so much. Um, it's a Dutch name. It sounds very exotic, but it's really quite common, you know, in the Netherlands yeah. where I'm from. <clears throat> and um, perfect pronunciation. You know, I, I talked to you a little bit about how to do the R, and you're doing it perfectly. <laughs> well, and like I said, it's it's that little that little bit of European in me. I'm not not quite in in uh, uh, the same country, but oh my gosh, I cannot tell you. I know I know we're kind of in public right now, but I am so happy to hear your voice. You you've always brought such a smile to my face. You have such a large heart. Uh, your own lives in um, in Los Angeles, and I have not ever uh, got to spend time with you in real life, but I hope to someday. I know that it, it's so wonderful to hear your voice and also hear Mary's voice because I was just realizing, listening to the story, that, you know, our 
our profession can be sort of a, a solitary existence, you know, where we just, you know, we see our clients and then, of course, we exchange online. But, you know, we're in, in our little, in our own little bubble and we don't get to interact a whole lot unless we're traveling and there's the, um, you know, the, the reunion once a year. But apart from that, there's not a whole lot of, um, you know, face-to-face mm-hmm. face or voice-to-voice. Voice voice. So this is, this is wonderful. I just had such a good time listening to Mary's um, account of the session, that wonderful session that she just um, talked about. And it was also nice to hear her voice and to match it to the, um, the post that I've read from her online and, you know, mm-hmm. find out where she lives and all that stuff. Really good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, there's not a whole lot of time left to see in, in the hour, right? You're oh, that's okay. You minutes. know, we could a- we, you could actually, if you wanted to, we could talk for two more hours. So no, no rush. And as a matter of fact, I, you know, I should say this. I should say this out loud. But uh, our wonderful friend Marilyn Dyke from Vancouver, she tried for 40 minutes to call in, and she said she's on the phone holding, and yet her phone number is not showing up on board. And I'm actually going to just read her blog post when when you're finished, and. And and that'll be our show. So please take your time and and chat with me. So no rush. And and tell All us, right. um, <laughs> the story. Yeah. You know the story. I know that I asked that I was hoping that you would tell would be uh, the client from the client from hell story, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a client so, um, about. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I just, if you would just tell our listeners about it. It was an amazing session that you had and, and um, we wanted to hear about it. Sure. So I, um, I went into using forgiveness quite a bit during the sessions and I've come to understand forgiveness is quite a pivotal um, thing or action in the sessions for people to, to heal from stuff and I've also experienced in my own life. And often when we talk about forgiveness, um, a lot of people associate it with forgiving someone else for doing something to them. Um, <clears throat> Uh, through the years and working with people and also the training I've received at the University of Santa Monica, um, the, uh, I did a master's in spiritual psychology. It has shaped my sort of my model of the universe and um, how I look at forgiveness and um, how I use it during sessions is often um, I look for the, for the judgments that we hold against ourselves because I think that, that is really where we, where, we, where we fracture and fragment our own life when we judge, when we when we pass judgment to ourselves and, and, and make our make our life smaller. So this this um, particular client that came to me with a lot of physical issues, you know, we um, we took her through um, a bunch of lifetimes. We we leapfrogged through them as as you as you probably don't know how that goes. Um, mm-hmm. And so we met we met her as a beautiful young woman that was part of a family that um, that that made spells and potions for people to harm others. So she was practicing, you know, what is called black magic. And um, she had just been taught, you know, it was passed down through the family. This was just something that they did to pay the bills. Um, so she was just doing something that to, to make ends meet. Um, and she didn't have any, like, ethical conflict about it. She didn't, you know, it didn't bump up against her own sense of morality or, you know, what she thought was right and wrong. It was just something that she did to pay the bills. So in that lifetime, she was killed by an angry crowd of people because, you know, she'd been the cause of so much harm that was done to the community. So they, they came and got her and, and they burned her. So, you know, in these sessions, we take people from then, um, we have them look at the lifetime and figure out what the lesson was. What did they start the life with to, to learn, to explore about themselves? And um, as she was reviewing that lifetime, she reported that her lesson is supposed to be used to learn how to use her powers wisely. And, you know, obviously she didn't quite learn it in that, in that lifetime. And she ended up feeling great remorse, lots of shame and lots of guilt for all the harm that she had caused in that lifetime. So, you know, we, we moved the client through these, these stages in the, in, in the sort of in, be, in between life state. And, um, after the review, we see, you know, where they go. Maybe they meet some loved ones or guardian angels. Um, I was, as I was trying to do this, she described that she could not move. She, she, was, she answered in distress, and she said she was in hell. She was being punished for everything that she had done. And she described this place as a very muddy, dark place with lots of 
contracted dark energy, and it was like she was chained down with lots of chains that were coming from everywhere. Speaking too fast, mm. by the way, I was trying to speak a little fast. <laughs> You're doing fine. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, so I, you know, it was an uncomfortable place, and I didn't want her to hang out there too long because I don't want her to be uncomfortable. And so, I can't connect. I'm sorry, my computer is speaking. Try again in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're connected just <clears throat> fine. I don't know what she's talking about. She is so polite, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I just I'm just turned her off. Sorry about that. Um, so I didn't want her to be uncomfortable for too long, you know, just look at the scene and then move her out of it. But she said she couldn't go anywhere. She could not leave. She was in hell, and that's where she was stuck. So this is, you know, a little bit of a, a tense area to be with a client when they cannot move and they're uncomfortable. You know, I, I care for the welfare of my client. So I reached in my bag of tricks and, you know, asked her to call on her guardian angel, but she said that there was too many dark energies and didn't allow for any connection with any, with any light. And that she just heard vile laughter when she was checking into this. So... Hmm. I was trying to figure out what to do. You know, it was kind of a, a, a tense moment. And then um, I talked to her about how, as people, we might be doing things that harm others, but it doesn't necessarily make us a bad person at our core. You know, I believe, and I'm sure you've experienced this through your, your work as well, that, you know, we're all spiritual being, beings that, that are having a human experience, meaning we're all part of the divine, we're all part of God, if you, you know, however you want to call that. Um, so when I was talking to her about that, I separated who she was as a person with the actions that she had um, done to harm these people. So we entangled the misbelief that actions are somehow descriptive of the value and goodness of who you are as a person. Um, hmm. And in that lifetime, you know, she's already stated that she had no feelings about what she was doing in that lifetime. She's quite unconscious about it. She said it was just something that she did to pay the bill. So she didn't really know any better. So what I was doing, I was trying to move her into a place where she could have compassion, compassion with herself to see that she was doing the best that she knew how to do. You know, she was living a difficult life. She was trying to pay the bills, and this was all that she knew. It was the best that she knew what to do with the circumstances that she was dealt. Um, mm-hmm. So during the pre-talk, before we went into the session, um, we had already explored that we choose our own lives. And um, even if we are in a lifetime where we, are, where we might be causing harm, that the other players that are part of this lifetime might have signed up for that as well to get the experience that they need on their path as well. So that gave her sort of more of a, um, like a bird's eye view of the whole situation. And it, it, it did lodge that, harsh judgment that she was passing on to herself a little bit. Um, and she was able to find compassion for herself in that lifetime. And then so we were able to work on her forgiving herself. So she was judging herself so harshly for all the harm that she had caused, which, of course, many of us would do because we feel terrible for the, for the mm-hmm. harm that we've caused. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, we worked on um, her being able to forgive herself. First, she said that, you know, she wanted God to forgive her. Um, so, and it sounded like she was asking for something bigger outside of her, but I reminded her that as people, as, as spiritual beings, we are, we are part of the divine, we're part of all that is, that, that she had the power within herself to, to do this for herself so that she could let herself off the hook and that would be enough. So I worked with her to say these phrases, uh, to forgive herself, for uh, judging herself as being bad and unworthy and evil and all those things, and also for buying into the misbelief that she needed to be punished for the things that she had done. Um, mm-hmm. So we kept, reaffirm- we kept reaffirming that and going over these self-forgivenesses. Um, and she started believing it and um, 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 absorbing it. And then we worked on her connecting with the truth of who she is, which is, you know, what we all are, we are light, we are love, we are compassion, we are kindness, we are, we are joy, we are light, we are magnificent. So we just stated these over and over and over again. And um, this uh, finally sort of sealed the deal and she saw the chains disappear and the light come in and um, all that darkness fall away. Called in the subconscious. 
and it confirmed that all the issues that she's been plagued with in her current lifetime were stemmed from this tremendous sense of guilt and condemnation that she'd been carrying um, and that the hell that was self-imposed, you know, which is, you know, which is always good to hear in this world where, you know, there's still a lot of religious beliefs out there where, you know, there's this, this fear mongering about, you know, if you do such and such and such, that you're not going to go to heaven, but you're going to go to hell. And in this session, mm-hmm. it was clearly stated that, you know, it was it was all self-imposed because she believed that she was going to go to hell, that she was going to get stuck there because she was judging herself and she believed that she needed to be punished. And um, mm-hmm. and then when she, you know, when she kind of mapped that situation out for herself, she was able to, to let go of it. She, she forgave herself and um, and it fell away. She was free of it all. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was a really a good illustration of, um, you know, how judging ourselves, you know, keeps you in a, in a tight spot. And, and if we can find the compassion uh, for ourselves and forgive ourselves, we can um, be whole again. It's such an amazing thing to think that, you know, for most of us across the planet, we are raised as children with some sort of, you know, imposed belief system from others upon us that that at some point some greater, big, giant power, usually male and older, sitting in some sort of chair is going to pass judgment on us. And and in this work, what we find is there there couldn't be anything further from the truth. We we never... I mean, you you tell me if you've ever had a session. I've never have where there's, you know, a lot of people come in with that fear. You know, I, you know, God doesn't love me. Jesus doesn't love me. I'm not worthy. All of that. And, and it's always not the case. It's just Mm, not any, any, any pain, any judgment, any hell that you are experiencing is exactly what you said. Self-imposed. Exactly. Because as soon as, seems like we move out of this lifetime and we, we um, you know, we raise in, in vibration and in, in consciousness and we are with, you know, our loved ones, our guardian angels, um, ascended masters. There is no duality as such where there is right and wrong. It's all part of this, this big game that we're playing here on earth where we learn to get to know ourselves better, to, to, to um, expand in loving um, through these sometimes very challenging situations. It's sort of like, you know, how, um, you know, coal gets to turn into a diamond through pressure, that sort of mm-hmm. process. So, mm-hmm. yeah, when we're, I mean, this is how how I see it when we're, you know, when we're in our earthly life, you know, we, we have these challenging experience and they teach us something about ourselves. Yeah. You know, and this, yes. it can often be, you know, very hard to to accept when we're going through very difficult situations. Um, I have one teacher that would always say, you know, there are no victims, all, only volunteers, you know, and that, that can be a very harsh thing to hear, you know, when, you're, when mm-hmm. you've had terrible life experiences and, or when you're in the midst of some, you're like, how can this be happening to me? You know, why me? Why is it so terrible? Lots of pain and stuff. But as soon as, you know, we sort of look at our lives from a bird's eye, or like say from the perspective of the soul, you know, or we move past the experience and later on we learn, um, we learn, we find out, you know, what we might find out what the experience is all about. Um, it was there to, to make us more of who we already are, to, to grow in loving. And it's interesting, isn't it, that, you know, there's pain and suffering that the human goes through seems sometimes to be, you know, so lengthy and so debilitating and so life-consuming but when you get the perspective from those who are not within this, uh, you know, time, yeah. space time construct, from the other side, it's a little bit of shoulder shrugging. It's a little bit of, well, <laughs> you know, it's not for that long. You know, right. in terms of eternity, what are, what are you, you know, what are you worried about? Just, you know, suck it up. Get the, you know, whatever. Just, right. You wanted this. You wanted yeah. this, you know. And, you know, I, I talk with my own clients about, I think I've said this on shows before, but I find myself talking about the idea of, and I don't watch t- TV hardly at all anymore. But, uh-huh. but I say to them, I say, imagine if, if, if I'm going somewhere in Hollywood, you might, you might 
relate to this considering where you live. But you right. know, imagine I go to some some Hollywood producer or whatever. And I'm I'm gonna have uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell them a show. I, here's my idea for a show. It's called The Happy Family. And there's a mother and a father and, say, three kids or whatever, and they're all very happy. And every day we see them at the breakfast table, and every day the sun is shining. And every day uh, we get to hear stories about the new promotion for dad and the new, uh, right. you know, bridge club win for mom. And, the, you know, the sunny boy is the football captain and the, the girl is the beauty queen and the little kid won the spelling bee. And then it's great and everybody loves each other and the show is over. And then next week, you know, the dad gets a promotion again, and then the mother does this, and it's a sunny day. I said, you know how long that show would last? That show would would be snoring. They'd be like, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) they fall asleep. We don't want it. And and if you as a human being don't want to kind of watch that in others, it tells you something about what you're made of and why you're here. You're here to experience. What's that quote about you didn't come here to be perfect, you came here to have a messy life? You know, uh, I, don't, I, don't have nice. that, I don't have that quote uh, memorized, but I should. You know, you came here to ex- to experience the roller coaster of it. You, it this is, you know, it's kind right. of why you came here. And then again, you know, there's other people who um, I've had a couple clients who have come to have a session, and they came kind of for entertainment purposes. They had really um, very uh, stable, normal uneventful lives where they really huh. were kind of basically bored. And uh, they, uh, this one gal came to me, she came, her daughter gave her like a gift certificate or something to have a session. Right. So she came to have to cut, to learn her past life. And, and she ended up just going to the Akashic records and uh, it was a great session in my perspective. She, you know, searched and searched and searched for the most important thing that she needed to learn in the Akashic Records. And it was kind of like this game of, uh, you know, hide and seek or or treasure or whatever. And she finally, you know, opens this book and she finally gets to the page and she looks at the page and, and she can't see it. And then she can see it. She only sees one word. And then she says, all I see is the word now. And I'm laughing. Huh. I mean, I am I am laughing in my chair about, that she is, you know, because I'm understanding what her what her SC, what her higher self is showing her is she's supposed to focus on the now, you know. Well, course, and when right. I asked about it, you know, when I asked about it, I'm like, you know, why'd you show her this session? Well, because she she thinks she doesn't have an exciting life. She's had horrible lives where she was miserable and lots of pain, lots of conflict. We gave her this life. She experienced this life. It's kind of like a rest. It's kind of like a vacation life. Vacation life. She's right. Just, right. Right. She's just she's just supposed to enjoy it. She doesn't have to worry. She doesn't have to work. She doesn't have any health problems. She doesn't have to do anything, but she thinks she's bored. She's bored. So she came to have a past <laughs> life regression to <laughs> to kind of have entertainment. Some excitement. Right. Pick up so, some and, and her right, and her S C shows her just this book that says the word now in it. <laughs> which of course we we know the S C says, you know, it takes you to the most appropriate time and place. So right. when she sat up, and I'm just grinning ear to ear because, you know, from your perspective and from mine, we can see this is absolutely brilliant and an absolutely successful session. And she's looking at me after I count her out, and she says to me, the very first thing she says is, I didn't have a past life. I mean, it was like, you know, like, I didn't, I didn't get what I came for. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, it is so funny. It is, isn't it? You know, she left. Um, she wasn't like the happiest person leaving. I, I, you know, and I'm hopeful, as I'm hopeful for all my clients, that at some point they realize that they absolutely got exactly what they needed right. in that session. Also, and that's what Dolores always taught us. You know, you will get exactly right. what exactly. you need no matter what exactly. it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's really beautiful. I also I love your your parallel with the, with the TV show. That was really funny because I think everybody can relate to them. They're like, yeah, there wouldn't be much to it, you know, like a show like that where it's just like everything is pastel colored and it's just you know, right, just the right. same and the same and the same. That's funny. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's I, I just also like, related yeah. to. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. 
No, no, please. Oh, yeah, what you said about, you know, the suffering and the pain, and then, you know, you talk to the ones, you know, on the other side, and they kind of, you know, the, the shrugging, you know, and then sometimes yeah. I find myself, like, really sort of, you know, working for my client and making them understand, like, what it's like to be in this human experience, and it's really, you know, it can be really, really difficult, and, and to please, you know, um, apply some healing, you know, come in and do, you know, make sure that the person is comfortable in this life, and they can, they can expedite they can do their their life purpose for going okay mm-hmm. yeah sure you know we'll take it away or <laughs> yeah but yeah it's like sometimes not a whole lot of sort of experiential understanding of what we go through here sometimes right right yeah. uh, it's a grand adventure isn't it it is a grand adventure and I, I love hearing these session stories and you know the very unique um different ways of you know how people receive the healing that was really beautiful where you described the, um, the Akashic Records book with the now in it. It's so funny. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're definitely going to have an Akashic Records show at some point because that's a, that's a topic all, all in itself. Hey, why don't you tell our listeners, you're going to be coming up in, in, um, in December at, with a special show all on your own. You want to give our listeners a little sneak peek about what that show is going to be about? Of course, because I'm so excited about it. So... <clears throat> You know, I'm, I hail from a northern European country, the Netherlands, and we're kind of skeptical as a culture. We're very rational. And so oftentimes, you know, I find myself doing this work. I'm thinking, is this all really true? Is this really happening? You know, I, I really, in this lifetime, I learned through experiences. So that's part of why I'm doing this work. You know, I'm getting to sort of experience spirit and these different realms of existence through other people. But, you know, I sometimes like, this is really true. It sounds so fantastic. So I... You know, I call myself lucky that I've had a couple of clients that had past life personas that have Wikipedia pages. Like, we would have the session, and then they would go home and, like, enter all the information. They, they might have even gotten their name and, like, the birth, of the, the, the date of birth. And they call me back all excited, like, oh, my God, you know, I just I just pulled up my own past life persona. This is over who I was. And, you know, there they can read their whole um, life story, like they just uh, found out about during the session. So one of these is a client who came to me because um, she was raised in church, had no frame of reference for any past life or reincarnation, and she has a little kid, uh, like a, was three years at the time, and he started telling her about how he used to be a tall German baseball player, and she thought the kid is not using his words correctly. You know, how can he be used to be? He probably tells me he wants to be. So... She listened to it for a bit, and then she started realizing this kid knew an awful lot about, you know, a very specific person uh, because he was telling her about his friend Babe and his mom, that she used to be his mom (laughs) in that other lifetime. So she started freaking out, and um, finally, you know, she found me, and she wanted to do a past life, and um, we found out she was his mom in that past lifetime, and and, and the the little kid was uh, Lou Gehrig, the the baseball legend. I'm already going too much a lot of detail about it, but yeah, I'll, I'll save it for the uh, for the December 11th. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it was it was just fascinating, and yeah, I'll, I'll tell I'll, I'll tell you more about it um, when we get to the other the other uh, Super. Uh, radio. Yeah. Super. Well, thank you so so much for for joining me this evening and telling your amazing story. And you know, if it, if it didn't come across, I'll say it again, all hell is self-imposed. Uh, you know, I, I think we can kind of make that uh, statement, you know, based upon what we're learning from, you know, the thousands and thousands and thousands of clients and, and people who, um, you know, other practitioners who share these sessions. For years now we get together and we share our stories and, and it just keeps uh, affirming and reaffirming all of the things that that our wonderful, late, great, beautiful teacher Dolores Cannon taught us about that, and uh, right. and so your your story was so so poignant, and I, I want to thank you once again for uh, joining me this evening and waiting um, uh, no to, uh, on on the phone to 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 share that. Why don't you tell people how they can get a hold of you in Los Angeles? And you do a lot of group regression workshops, don't you? Yeah, I do. I, I really love this work. I love doing the groups, <clears throat> especially because in Los Angeles, I don't know about other places, but there are a lot of younger generation, the the third wave of volunteers that um, 
that uh, seem to be attracted to this kind of work. So it seems to be a platform for these people to come in and, you know, share life stories even um, after we do a, mm-hmm. a group regression. So I do those once a month, the first Friday of the month in Los Angeles. Um, and then, of course, I do private sessions, and um, I'm in central Los Angeles, um, Eagle Rock, close to Pasadena and Glendale, but I do alcohols as well. My website is Source energy therapy it's hyphenated so source energy therapy and um okay yeah. all right and you can find me on you have the lord of the yep you sure can so you have a good rest of your evening thank you so much for joining me it's so great to talk to you finally after all these years i know thank you for having me it was great to hear your voice <laughs> and i'm so happy that you're doing the show so important thank you thank you we'll, we'll all talk right. uh, we'll talk baseball next time <laughs> All right. Well, good, Have a good night. Good night. Bye. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, dear, dear man um, that I've known for for many years. So Dolores blessed me with um, allowing me to create the support forum, and I've made friends around the planet. And uh, Jerome was one of them. Uh, his heart is so big. I can feel it all the way across this country. Um, a really, truly beautiful man. If you have any um, chance at all to go to one of his group sessions or to see him there in the Los Angeles area, we've got lots of great people in California, um, two or three really excellent practitioners in Los Angeles. So, so one of the things that, really upset me about this evening is I could not get my friend Marilyn online. I don't know what was going on. She she called in. She tried three times. From her end, it appeared as if she was holding, and I could never see her phone number. And she really wanted to tell this story. So while we were chatting back and forth, she actually just uh, the little article via email. And so um, our dear friend uh, Marilyn Dyke from Vancouver was going to tell us the story, but now I'm just going to read it for her because it's a, a really terrific one. So this is forgiveness in the between lifetime state and its power to heal. Forgiving in, is, in my opinion, one of the f- most important things we can do for ourselves while we are in body. True forgiveness wipes the slate clean and signifies we have truly finished the task. And we don't even have to do it face-to-face for it to be effective. I've seen people have profound experiences when they have forgiven during QHHT. As Dolores said, emotions can't be faked while the person is in hypnosis. And it's for this reason I feel that forgiving during a session is so powerful. So the first session that Marilyn wanted to talk about here, a female client who had experienced very challenging family relationships all of their lives. And these follow a theme of belittling her, a lack of respect, support, and even validity from their closest family members in this life. Those who we would naturally think would be on our team to support us have not been there for her. So this particular client was an accomplished professional who worked with individuals to improve their lives. And she actually would call this person a healer. She had a total of three sessions with her working on other issues as well, and she found that she received more benefit from one session that she has in years of traditional therapy. So during the interview, Marilyn explained how we plan our lives and ask those close to us in our soul cluster to play certain parts in the incarnation to help us learn. And I explained that those who accept the role of villain in our life are often our closest friends, who love us the most on the other side. And Marilyn is speaking here. I believe these souls agree to play these roles for us, not for us, not because they sincerely want to help us grow. Hmm. I believe these souls agree to play for us because they sincerely want to help us grow. I would imagine it would actually be very difficult for them. I mean, think about this for a moment. Think about a person in your life now who you love, and trust unconditionally. It may be a parent, a child, a partner, a friend, and imagine them to hurt them physically, mentally, or emotionally. How do you feel about this? Is this a part you would jump at the chance to play? I wouldn't. 
But in the spirit state, another soul will volunteer to play this villainous role because they love us and they want to help us learn to evolve. And ultimately, it is hoped that we will forgive. So after Marilyn explained all of this to her client, she shot back with, oh, Marilyn, that just doesn't help at all. And during her first session, there weren't any opportunities to forgive. But in the second session, she was overjoyed when after exploring a past life, she found herself at the point where she was pre-planning the life she's living now. And Marilyn hadn't asked her to go there, but the SC automatically took her there. And this confirmed for me that it was something she needed to understand. So this particular client is in the spirit state and identified all her close relatives in this life as being her closest soul group members in this pre-planning stage. And Marilyn could feel the excitement and joy she was experiencing just connecting with them again in this form. And after the roles had been cast and everything was set, I asked the client, what are you feeling? What is the overriding emotion as you look at each being in this group? Said, overcome with tears. And in that moment, Marilyn knew that she got it and she was on her way to forgiveness and lasting healing. And after her sessions, she began a new life and she's now happy and self-assured and busier than ever in her career and social settings. Her family members are still there, but no longer have the emotional impact they once had over her with some of the rela- and in with some of them, the relationship has improved. And she tells another client, a very sweet, gentle soul in his mid seventies, wanted to find out what the purpose of his stepfather was in his life. Although decades removed, this man could still feel the hatred directed towards him as a child. I will never forget. This question, she says, I want to know why my stepfather hated me so much. I've never hated anyone the way he hated me. So Marilyn then explained to him how we see the roles still in place in our life much more clearly in this in-between lifetime state. And forgiveness is so much easier when we can step back and see it from that perspective. So she asked, would you like to forgive your stepfather today? And he said, oh, no, I couldn't possibly do that. I just wanted some understanding of the situation. So for this man, forgiving his stepfather was completely out of the question. So Marilyn writes, as a practitioner, you know, you can never know exactly how a session is going to go. So it's important for the client and the practitioner not to have expectations. But she couldn't help but hope that he would encounter an opportunity to forgive and put the relationship with the stepfather to rest once and for all. So as luck would have it, after he explored a past life, he found himself in that magical in-between lifetime state. And when you watch a client's face while they're greeting long-lost loved ones, it just lights up the room. And the client was overjoyed at seeing so many close relatives. The happiness just radiated. And after he greeted grandparents, parents, and many others, I asked him if anyone else was there. He took in a huge breath, surprised at seeing his stepfather coming towards him, beaming with love. And he said, you know what? He's so proud of me, and he loves me so much. Oh, how could I not see that? This man was expressing through tears how he understood that this very dear friend was his most loving supporter, helping helping him to learn. And when Marilyn asked if he for, could forgive his stepfather now, he replied, you know what? There's nothing to forgive. He did exactly what I needed. You can imagine the relief the client felt after forgiving and letting go of all of that heavy emotional weight. It's such an honor to be able to help someone reach this deep level of understanding and forgiveness in session. So that was the amazing session of Marilyn Dyke, who she really wanted to tell us that story herself and um, and just could not, could not get... Um, get through on the technology so maybe next time and actually um i would have asked marilyn too marilyn's going to be on an upcoming show in december with a good friend of hers and and another qhht practitioner um who is a astrologer and we are going to talk about dolores cannon's astrology chart now how cool of of a show will that be So let me see. I'm going, uh, we had a caller holding a little while ago, but I think they either dropped off or um, 
checked their calling status or their questioning status. So, so what I'd like to do now as we kind of wind down the show is, is a couple of things. First, the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to read a Dolor, Dolores Cannon blog. A Dolores Cannon blog on forgiveness. Dolores taught us this very simple method of forgiveness, but she also spoke about this with others in lectures and in book readings and etc. And so here is her public blog on forgiveness. Dolores writes, People at my lectures are always asking me what to do, what do they have to do in order to ascend to the next dimension and move to the new earth. They, in quotes, have said there are two key things to let go of for the transformation to take place. One of the two things to release is fear. Fear is an illusion, yet it is the strongest emotion that a human can feel. It must be released or it will hold you back from transformation. Think for yourself. Do not give your power away to anyone. Make up your own mind and discover your own truth. Do not let fear cloud your judgment so that you cannot think for yourself. Transformation from this dimension to the next requires that you be free of fear. And the second thing you must let go of to experience evolution and transformation is karma. And we know that that is ending in our life now. We are accumulating or we accumulate karma by living many, many lifetimes on earth, often with the same people repeating the same mistakes. This explains the term, the wheel of karma. We all have bad things happen in our lives. This is part of what life is about. And I have found that we agree to experience these things and events in order to learn from them. And if you've learned from a thing, from a difficult experience, that was the reason it happened. Transformation is a process of releasing fear and karma, and it's not always easy. During my lectures, I give people an exercise they can use to release karma and assist their transformation. You do not need to confront the person you have karma with to speak to them face-to-face. They may not be available or they may have left this world already. Before this incarnation, you made a plan for what you hoped to achieve in this life and agreed to the contracts with many souls to play parts to oppose you on this earthly stage. Transformation can be brought by releasing any negative karmic attachments. So here, Dolores' procedure. Picture the person you have difficult karma with in your mind standing in front of you. Say to them, we tried. We really tried. It's not working, and I'm tearing up the contract. I forgive you. I release you. I let you go. Go your way with love, and I will go mine. None of this is easy, but it is essential to grow and realize the beauty of transformation. And that is the Dolores Cannon forgiveness process. And I'm going to take another peek here over at the callers and see if anybody wants to ask a question or tell a story. And I don't see anyone with their hand up. So what I'd like to do now is just one more thing. Um, I'd like to read a meditation, a beautiful meditation by one of our community members, one of the people in the original Dolores Cannon QHHT support forum community. Her name's Linda Froelich. And she is from Michigan. And she wrote this beautiful forgiveness meditation process. And so maybe some of you out there have have somebody that you have conflict with or somebody that that you have a, a bad experience with. Maybe you'd like to think about this meditation helping you. This is from Linda. For those of you who have had a hard time meditating because you cannot steal your conscious mind, this is perfect because it allows conscious involvement in the beginning and over time. And more silence can be achieved and expanded as the mind becomes still. It is in the stillness where we commune with the divine and the higher self that we begin to merge with it. 
Linda says, I developed this meditation over the last year. It is designed to deepen our connection with our higher self, with each other, all of humanity, and all of life everywhere. The mantra gives direction to the mind, and that's the beauty of meditation. It's a wonderful tool for our spiritual growth and expansion. It does not have to be difficult, cumbersome, or even take a lot of time. It should be an enjoyable experience where the benefits are not only felt during the meditation, but also, more importantly, throughout the entire day. Simple and sweet is best. You do not have to sit cross-legged or in a lotus position. Just find a comfortable place, feet on the floor, spine and neck straight, arms sitting gently at the lap or at the sides. You may light a candle or incense or use crystals, anything at all if you wish, but it's not necessary. The atmosphere you feel most comfortable and helpful to you. So if you'd like, please join me now to do this. With eyes open, take a deep breath in through the nostrils to the count of five and then hold for the count of five. And then exhale for the count of five, pushing all the breath out through the mouth. Repeat this breathing three to five times. In for five, hold for five, and exhale for five. Feel any tension leaving your body through each out breath. Center yourself and breathe, re- breathe regularly and close your mouth and your eyes and smile. Bring in the attitude of gratitude and count your blessings. Start by being thankful for the new day, for the new opportunity, for growth and expanding and understanding and being positive in service to life, whatever and whatever it may be for you. Thank your body for all it does every day. Your body's your partner. You need to thank it. This is also a good time to reinforce healing. Think of your higher self, your teachers, your guides, people in your life, situations. However long or short the list, you need to be thankful for whatever it is every day. We remind ourselves and reinforce how blessed we are every day. Next is an exercise that may be done only once a week or every day if needed during a difficult time for forgiveness. And here you go. To all of those who I've hurt or harmed in any way, consciously or unconsciously, intentionally or unintentionally, in this life and all others, I'm sincerely sorry. Please forgive me. To all of those who have hurt or harmed me in any way, consciously or unconsciously, intentionally or unintentionally, I forgive you. Therefore, I forgive myself for all my mistakes, my imperfections, and my weakness. I choose to live free of the negative programming, the judgment, and the fear-based reality and live according to that which I really am, the divine, experiencing a human embodiment. Let me bring forth that love and light and the bliss to share with all. And so here's a mantra that Linda also teaches us. You can repeat this 20 to 25 times and smile when you say it. Here is the mantra. Namaste, Prima, Seva, Anand. What does that mean? Well, Namaste, you've heard that before. I recognize and honor the divine source in you that is also in me. When we're both in this awareness, there's no space between us, and we are one. Prima is the divine unconditional love. Seva is service, in this case, divine service. And undawned is the bliss. Should be expanded to feel the vibration in the throat. There you go. Bliss is the expression or emotion of being immersed in divine love. So this mantra means the divine and ultimate realization we are all one, but living as unique individual souls. And when we dedicate our lives to loving service, raising our vibration and frequency to that level, to the uplifting and enlightening of all life, then we will merge our intention with the higher self. And as a result, we will experience our natural state, divine love and its expression, which is bliss. There's nothing in our earthly experience that can compare to the state of mind and being. This is within us all. 
So why use the Hindi language? Well, the whole concept can be incorporated into just a few words. The language is beautiful and melodic, which aids aids the meditative state. So if you're going to try this mantra, try be quiet for about 10 minutes before. Nothing to think, feel, or do. Just be still and silent. Just be. And then do the meditation with the mantra in 20 minutes or longer if time is waited or if more time is wanted, excuse me. And at the end of the silence before opening eyes, take a second to set the intention to carry this feeling forward throughout the day. It's really a beautiful one. And if you find yourself in moments of anger or irritation, just repeat the mantra silently silently to yourself for a few times to redirect your thoughts. And while falling asleep, it also can carry into the sleep state. So remember this, Beautiful mantra is Namaste, Prima, Seva, Anand. And that's from the beautiful Linda Froelich in Michigan. And so I'll check one more time to see if there's anyone who has their hand up, and they do not. So I think that's it for the show tonight. I want to thank you all who've tuned in, who've called in, who've bothered to listen. (laughs) tonight or in the future in our archives. Thank you so much for joining us. The world could really use forgiveness. Those in our lives could use forgiveness. But most importantly, please remember to forgive yourself. If you can forgive yourself, you'll find it easier to forgive others. So thank you so much again. And I'd like to remind you again, those of you who are looking for a practitioner of Dolores' method, you can find them at DoloresCannonQHHT.com. That's Dolores Cannon and the letters QHHT, all in a line, dot com. And you can find out more about my own practice of QHHT at NewEarthJourney.com. So please join us again next Friday where we'll have another amazing show lined up for you. Good night. Thank you so much. God bless.